Okay, so welcome everyone to the to our colloquium this week. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have Professor Partho Sharati Mojumdar as our colloquium speaker today. And I would invite uh, Professor Mojumdar's student, come collaborator. Uh, he's a friend of all of us, uh, but uh, particularly in the last few years, many of you might know or might not know that uh, Professor Mojumdar had been working with many of our students, our masters and bachelor students, and there have been a number of publications with Professor Mojumdar and our students and, uh, and Professor Ratna Kole, I'll just invite her because she has been uh, you know, coordinating all these projects and has been a part of the scientific uh, endeavor that all of them created. So I just invite Professor Ratna Kole today to invite uh, our speaker. Uh, thank you, Shuchetona. Uh, actually, Parthoda uh, needs no introduction for most of us. Now it is working. Yes. So, uh, but still, uh, for the new students, I think uh, uh, we should say something. Uh, Parthoda, okay, before I go into the details about uh, what it means collaborating with Parthoda. Uh, let me first uh, tell you that Parthoda did uh, his PhD from Brandeis after completing his tech degree from IIT Kharagpur. <laughs> and then he did uh, postdoc at uh, Yayufar, then Maryland, and maybe SINT, I don't know. Yes, okay. And after that, he joined as a faculty member uh, at SINP. Then he moved to Max Science at Chennai. And they get, again, he came back to SINP. And after that, uh, he moved to uh, Belud. <laughs> and he has taught at many institutes. And you know, all the institutes around in and around Kolkata, we are privileged to have a teacher like Parthoda. And I can share a memory when we were a student at uh, Jadavpur. We had very we had few opportunities to uh, listen to lectures from eminent scientists, but it was the first ever lecture for uh, at least my lifetime. And it was Parthoda's lecture. And that was on black holes. And that time we were so fascinated about black holes and the lecture was, and I can, even today it was back 24 years back now, <laughs> but I can even, uh, I mean, in my memory, that is very prominent till then. Um, okay, so my uh, experience as a student of Arthuda, that was uh, back in, again, 2001, where I attended one quantum field theory course uh, at the SERC school. And we were there from all over the country. And most of us actually did some course about uh, on uh, quantum field theory. And for most of us, that was actually our second course on quantum field theory. But experience-wise, that was wonderful. Uh, as I uh, tell my students also, who uh, uh, goes to IACS for now, uh, for their masters, that you will, get to attend some lectures where, you know, you will feel a fierce change after the lecture within you. And that is something, whenever we do any academic uh, uh, discussion with Parthoda, every time we feel like, oh, when we started the discussion and when we ended the discussion, there is, you know, you have a change in your potential energy. <laughs> And that is actually the thing that I uh, and I and all the st students with whom actually uh, I and uh, Parthoda, we all have worked actually 
my supervisor, my teacher, come postdoc mentor, all of us, we have uh, worked with Parthoda and we all share the same experience that discussing physics with Parthoda, that is something very special, especially uh, connecting different fields. Uh, that is something very special. So I will not waste more time on this. Uh, about today's talk, uh, I'm most, I mean, I, when I was reading the abstract, I uh, always just, I, as always, I get fascinated with the topic. But this time I'm more fascinated about the end part that the quantum gravity effects we are now uh, hoping to see in future gravity wave experiments. So please uh, uh, welcome Pathoda to the lecture, uh, please. Thank you very much, Rokhna, for that uh, eloquent introduction, which makes me a little embarrassed. I, I'm not sure I deserve it. Um, OK, do I need a microphone? Yes. I, I should it's stand here. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. So let's see how this. Uh... Or maybe this will work. Yeah. No, this doesn't work either. Wait. Okay. I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. So what I was saying is, I'm extremely grateful for this introduction as well as Professor yeah. Suchetana Chatterjee's invitation to come here. And Suchetana and I have been very good friends. Um, but the most amazing thing is that today is uh, to the date, uh, six years ago, an anniversary of my own colloquium yes. at presidency. Yes. Okay, but but I was going to speak, I suggested two topics when Sushetana contacted me. Uh, one was the one that, that's there, and the other one was involving analog gravity. And then I realized that six years ago I had given a talk on analog gravity. So uh, there was a chance that you might think I'm recycling my talk. So that was one of the reasons why I decided not to give the talk, which you can also agree. Okay, and it's, uh, I, I really felt wonderful during those colloquia. I was telling uh, Professor Ritabhan Chatterjee that uh, I have learned my astrophysics here, as it were, okay, because. Um, I was sort of a purist purist, and that's not a good thing to be. And I think these young people, Ratna, Shomodip, Yutoban, Shutakona, and of course, Devashish and Shobhan, they're also there. Uh, they, in fact, were very instrumental in changing my attitude, okay? So I hope that I shall be able to get to the end of this talk where you will see a connection with very recent data, but if not, maybe another talk, <laughs> if, if after the situation arises. Okay, so there we are. If this, if this works, it's even better. No, this, this is okay. Here. Lal. Lal. This one? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, why should you even think about quantum gravity? Right, because Quantum gravity is not like any other theory, like quantum electrodynamics or quantum electroweak interactions, quantum chromodynamics, which are all quantum theories with definite observational predictions. There is nothing that relates quantum gravity to any observations so far. And therefore the question is why should we, so that is why must we quantize gravity? Do we need to? Maybe we don't need to. And a lot of people go through life without ever having wondering, wondered about quantum gravity. But I'd like to argue though, that looking at the structure of GR, general relativity, for as long as I have, you get to feel that yes, this can't be a complete theory, which was exactly what Einstein felt when he looked at electrodynamics. Remember Einstein's uh, studenthood was in the 19th century when Maxwell was, had, had already written down the Maxwell equations and people were fascinated. And there were some 
experimental hints that perhaps Maxwell's equations aren't working. One of the hints came, as you know, from black body radiation. Using Maxwell's equation to understand black body radiation led to the famous ultraviolet catastrophe. And the other was a 19th century discovery by Lenard of the photoelectric effect. So these difficulties with the Maxwell theory were there when Einstein began his studenthood. And he was very aware of them. But then he felt that you should start by looking at the Maxwell's equation themselves. Is there anything wrong with them? And that was already quite a, a, a fantastic challenge because who would dare to talk about Maxwell? And he did. So here we are. Well, I've written down this in little, uh, perhaps a little obscure notation. This is the wave equation for the vector potential, the, the space-time vector potential for a bunch of moving charges, relativistically moving charges. So the current on the right-hand side is written down in terms of the bunch of moving charges, each with proper time parameter tau i for velocity u tau i. And x bar of tau i for each i is basically the trajectory of the ith particle in space-time. So that's it. Now, what is wrong with this? The left-hand side of this equation, the vector potential, you know, is a continuous smooth function. And the right-hand side, you can see, because of this delta function, is anything but smooth. So you see, begin to see that there must be a problem here. There could be a problem here. And this is what old Albert points out, that here he says finite, but it's really countable. This need not be finite but they're certainly countable if you have charge quantization. If you have charge quantization, then of course the current is, has to be written down in some formula like this. So it's countable, you can count them. On the other hand, you can't count a continuous function, as you know, this is elementary mathematics, right? So there is this difficulty. And the question is, is this sufficient to determine this? Now, he points out the two contradictions, two mathematical, two observational discoveries as contradictions. Oh, Indonil, my friend is here. Hello, Indonil. So he points out these two contradictions. One is, of course, black body radiation. And I mentioned Bose. I, I should remember to tell you what, why Bose is mentioned there. And the other one is the photoelectric effect. So one involves transformation of the energy of matter into light, that's black body radiation, and the other one is uh, light into matter, which is the photoelectric effect. Now, I trust that all of you are familiar with the, these two effects. So there is obviously a contradiction. The contradiction appears when you try to understand, for instance, the spectrum of black body radiation, you run into the ultraviolet catastrophe, and also the photoelectric effect when you try to understand the fact that the photo current should depend on the frequency of the light falling on the object, on the, on the metal surface, rather than the intensity. So these two facts cannot be understood on the basis of Maxwell's equations. So there is a problem. And therefore, Einstein decided that light must also be discrete, made up of quanta. That's the famous light quantum hypothesis, which you can read here. So you see a connection between particle and wave properties right here. Now here I want to make a comment, you know. People, I mean, historians also tend to give credit for starting the quantum theory to Max Planck, right? And uh, historically that is to some extent true, but on the other hand, you have to look at Max Planck's papers. If you see the papers, you will see something very strange. It's actually a great example in Bakmara. Back calculation. Back calculation. So here was a problem. And Max Planck who was a firm believer in the continuum, by the way. He wrote eloquently about the continuum at various places. He decided that, well, let's have these little oscillators with energy equals h bar omega. Why? Nobody knows. What oscillators are these? Nobody knows. There's no concept of atom in the physical literature at the time. It was there in chemistry, by the way. 
The chemists were dealing with atoms merrily, but not the physicists. So there was this issue there. So Max Planck didn't quite know, and it took him a while to realize that he had destroyed his favorite continuum of classical mechanics. Huh? So do I have to do something? Yes, nothing. Asking me to take a pause. Asking me to take a pause. I just started. No, that's okay. <laughs> So that's why I think that it was really Albert Einstein who really knew what was going on. And he gave these formulas for the first time. And they're very pregnant formulas, actually. And of course, then you move forward. Because Einstein had no idea how to go from the Maxwell's equations to the theory of photons. Absolutely no idea. He made the hypothesis because that seemed experimentally viable. If you believe in charge quantization, then you must believe that photons must exist. But how do I get to photons starting with Maxwell's equations? In other words, how do I quantize the electromagnetic field? That came much later, about 30, 35 years later. This is quite amazing. And now, of course, we know that this is the best model. If you have freely streaming photons, like in the laser, then they are basically a bunch of uncoupled harmonic oscillators of various frequencies, one frequency for each momentum of the photon, okay? So that's the best description we have so far of light in the quantum theory, and it's in terms of these quantum harmonic oscillators. And of course, then you talk about interactions, and there came QED, and QED presented another surprise because of the great work of well, three people, really, Tomonaga, Feynman, and Schwinger, but Feynman, was the most spectacular because while the others were feverishly doing all kinds of difficult mathematics, Feynman found a way to draw diagrams with simple rules to compute quantum mechanical amplitudes from just these diagrams. Okay, so there was always this attitude that do I need to give a derivation? Do I, well, you need to do a derivation, but you can't derive everything, right? You can't derive, for instance, the Newton's laws or the Maxwell's equations and fundamental laws of nature cannot be derived. They have to be guessed, right? So guesswork is very potent a, a, a weapon in our arsenal of theoretical physics. And this man, Richard Feynman, was able to guess the rules. He guessed the rules. And the derivation came much later. He provided the derivation, but that came much later. So he guessed the rules. And believe you not, here I have quoted for you the calculation of the G minus two. So you can see that this is the experimental value. So the agreement between theory and experiment is just mind boggling. Not only is it amazing, it is also beyond any such agreement in any other part of physics. There's no part of physics to, till today with all the LHCs and everything, which has a greater accuracy, has shown a greater accuracy between theory and experiment. And I think that this is what I call truth. I mean, what is truth, right? You can go philosophically eloquent about this is truth and that is truth, Upanishad, this, that, Quran, Bible, whatever, okay? But truth is this, is that somebody is doing the theory there and somebody else is doing the experiment there and they're calculating the same quantity and the quantity should agree to one in 10 to the nine. Come on, give me a break. What's going on? How would they know each other? How would they know these results? No back marking, back calculating here. So truth is how close you are to experiment because experiment is the door to, door to nature. Without that, we have nothing in physics. The question then is how about, so you have got all these photons, you've quantized the electromagnetic theory, and now you've got this fantastically accurate statements, but in this whole room with all the bunch of photons streaming at us, where are our continuous electric and magnetic fields? How do we get back to them? It's a good question. There, of course, for the hint, we go back to the harmonic oscillator because harmonic oscillator, by the way, I should mention that I'm speaking, but there is no syllabus here as uh, Shri Chaitanya would know and everybody will agree that there is no syllabus. So if any time you feel like asking a question, just raise your hand and fire away, okay? I have no, nothing to complete here. Whatever you allow me, I'll complete up to that 
When you start getting bored, you quit, I quit, okay? So please don't hesitate to ask questions. But of course, I'm saying this with Madam's permission. <laughs> okay, so the point is that if you want to know, for instance, take a single <coughs> harmonic oscillator and ask, hey, when I was young, I studied this uh, pendulum system or you know, spring mass system and wrote down this formula, right? X equal to X dot cosine omega T. But where from the quantum oscillator structure do I get that? How do I get that solution out? And the answer is this business of coherent states. You can't probably see this. It's, uh, I, I, I guess I could probably, oh, this can't go, go away, right? Yeah. Anyway, so the point is that, so among all, you have, you know that there are these occupation number states of quantum harmonic oscillator, right? But those do not provide you the means to get to this x, x dot cosine omega t. What you need is to construct some sort of a specific linear combination, which is this linear combination. Here, n are the occupation number states, and alpha is a complex parameter. So these states, they are actually, as you can see, eigenvalues of the annihilation operator, right? And if you use them, then you can show that between these alpha states, it has the solution that you knew from your childhood. So it has come back. These are called coherent states. And they, you can easily show, also satisfy the minimum uncertainty principle, the minimum uncertainty quantity, which is the delta S delta P is equal to H bar or h bar by two. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah, h bar by two. And then this idea, because you knew that after all photons can be thought of as harmonic oscillators, Professor E.C. George Sudarshan, Indian American physicist, and this is Roy Glauber. Uh, as you might know, Glauber got the Nobel Prize for work that Sudarshan did. And here we have an expert, uh, Shobhan, Shobhan Shundar, I mean, he's your, Professor Shobhan Shundar is your teacher. And if you want to know more details about how this switch occurred, why Sudarshan wasn't awarded the Nobel Prize, he will have lots of funny stories to tell you. But indeed, he was the man who found it. And I, I think uh, Glauber's work was solid, but it followed what Sudarshan did. And you could then get the continuum description of classical electrodynamics via the Maxwell's equations from looking at coherent states of quantum electrodynamics. Now, let me go into space time. Well, I did not have drawn this here, but this is for everybody. So this is a famous special relativity light cone, and you can see the various parts. So compared to this, this is the present, this is the future, that's the past. And this, this was taken from the internet referring to CMB. So obviously CMB is in your past, and therefore you see the light going along the edge of the cone. Inside, like I am standing here, my world line is just along the time axis and et cetera. So you have this. Now, when you turn on gravity, the picture changes. How does it change? First of all, something you know, this is Huygens construction of waves, right? And what you know is that if you have plane waves, for instance, then this surface of constant phase is a plane surface and in the absence of gravity, it will go like this. But in the presence of gravity, you see this. There's a tilt in the in the, in the uh, wave front, and that means that in the presence of gravity, this wave will bend because the direction perpendicular to the wave front is the direction of propagation of the wave. And this is really strange because according to the Maxwell theory, what we know for sure is that light carries no mass. According to Newton, only mass can produce gravity or will can respond to gravity. Now, if this is the same, then why is that light is bending under gravity? And this is, this is only possible if you use Einstein's equivalence principle. According to this principle, well, first of all, gravitational mass and inertial mass are identical. And secondly, all frames of reference are good ones, not just inertial frames. So that was the first departure from the special of special relativity, which restricted yourself to inertial frames. So you went beyond that and now spoke of all frames. Of course, all frames also has to be qualified. 
So we are talking about coordinate systems which are related by continuous functional transformations. That's called the general coordinate invariance. So if you use that, now this equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass is an experimental fact. But the equivalence of all frames is another of Albert Einstein's humongous leap of faith. There is no experimental evidence till today. But you, you assume that, and then you get these facts for which there is experimental support. For instance, light bends, okay? For instance, light changes color, frequency under gravity. For instance, well, if you take these two facts, then it's easy to see that suppose uh, Madam there wants to get out. Well, she, she's got a good example. Let's take somebody here. Yeah, that gentleman sitting there. Suppose he wants to go to the door. Now, if he takes a straight path, some of you will yell. Hey, so he has to go like this. So he has to follow a curved path. And the fact that he has to follow a curved path is not his fault or he's not even responsible for it. I'm not responsible, but the arrangement, the geometry of this room is responsible. So that light bends, you see, under gravity. So if it bends near the sun, which was one of the first predictions, light coming from a distant star bent near the sun, there must be something that the sun is doing to the space time around it, to the geometry around it for which this light has to bend. It has no other choice. So it's no force involved, sorry. So there's no force involved in this. There's a change in geometry brought about by gravity. Nobody is pulling light. You can't pull light. But indeed, if you do change the, the geometrical profile around a massive body, then light coming into that has to bend, you see. It has no choice. Free propagating light, still freely propagating, but propagating along the bent path. And hence, we can say that light or space time, you see, this is the other thing. So I should show you the, this, this picture, which shows that you still have light cones, you see. Locally, you have special relativity, but this special relativity is different from this special relativity. Why? Because you see the light, the light cone has bent and it has also distorted. Yes, yes, you tell me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, if you, well, to answer that question, one thing is that you can think of the equation which I wrote down at the beginning, which is uh, well, this one, right? So this one, this equation itself tells you that as a field, it cannot have a mass. If it had a mass, then there'll be an m squared c squared term added to the box squared, which is the klein gordon equation, right? So that's the technical answer. The actual answer is that here, if you look at, yeah, if you, yeah, this is classical. This is classical, classical klein gordon equation. But if you look at the other option is to solve this equation and look for how far away the influence of the source stays. And that is very far away. Now, the, the extent to which the influence of the source will stay determines whether the field has a mass or not. For instance, if it's a short range field, it'll die off with an exponential tail. This is not there for this case. Okay, so because of that, the field itself cannot carry a mass. One way to think about the field carrying a mass is to look at the Fourier modes of the field. What kind of an equation do they obey? So the Fourier modes are usually labeled by some parameter k, and k has this property that k squared is zero, which means that k is like light. Therefore, everything with, with its k squared equal to zero must travel at the velocity of light. And if there was a mass, then it would be k squared equals m squared c squared. So that's just like the, the uh, dispersion relationship between energy and momentum for a relativistic particle with mass. But there, if the right-hand side is zero, k squared is zero, that must correspond to a field which does not carry any mass. So that's... I, I think if I understand, I think when you are talking about classes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean classes. I mean, classes is done before the advent of. Yes. I think before I the advent of? Oh, no, this is, this is, uh, this was already known. So you can't have an m squared c squared term there because of gauge invariance. So Maxwell already knew that. Maxwell is already telling you 
that you cannot have an M squared C squared term there. So it's something that Maxwell showed us for the groups. So that immediately tells you that light must be a long range phenomenon, infinite range in principle, okay? And therefore, you cannot associate a mass parameter because the moment you associate a mass parameter, there'll be a tail, like a new power interaction, for instance, which is short range, okay? Therefore, light cannot carry a mass that follows from the Maxwell's equations, purely classically. However, so, so here what we see is that these light cones, you see, light still follows these edges, but the light cones align themselves in such a way that the light curves itself so as to follow this edge here and also to the other edges. So you see two kinds of effect due to gravity, due to curvature of space time. One is that these light cones, you see, are tilted with respect to each other. And the tilt is a measure of the curvature. But the, uh, there's also another thing. These light cones are also deformed. Some are spread out, some are thinned, compacted, okay? And that just tells you that there must be two kinds of curvature. There is one curvature whose job is simply to tilt, but there must be another kind of curvature whose job is to deform the light cone. One is called the Ricci curvature, named after Ricci, Italian mathematician, the other is called the Weil curvature, which is which causes deformation. So it is like uh, you know those of us who wear glasses will know this. You have uh, spherical uh, lenses for magnification, and then you have, must have cylindrical components. All of us do, which causes aberration, right? For ab correcting aberration, what is that called? Astigmatism, I think. You need to have aberration. So the Weil is like what cures astigmatism, and Ricci is, is the magnification. So this is basically it. So light does travel at the velocity of light along the edges, and you or me would travel in the middle as, as massive particles shown here, okay? How about, oops, sorry. He's not happy with me for some reason. Always happens. You know. <laughs> happiness of computers <laughs> is more than happiness of humans. Okay? Can make life very difficult. Ah, page. I, 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 this one, we were here. Ah, so I, this one, yes. Okay, so the question is what makes space time curve? And this is the essence of this equation called the Einstein equation. This is curvature. And this is energy momentum. So anything having energy momentum, not necessarily mass. Of course, if something has energy momentum, it may or may not have mass. Light, for instance, has both energy and momentum without having mass. But you or me have energy and momentum. Some people have lost both, but let's not worry about them. <laughs> and this second equation is basically the equation for a free particle in a curved space time. It's called the geodesic equation. This one represents how much it will change from flat space time. But this is basically an equation which says that there is no acceleration because acceleration must be caused by a force and there is no force. It's the change in geometry. So this is the additional change in geometry. Okay, so there we are. You can read these things. But what I should point out is that Never in the history of human thinking was ever this statement made, as far as I know, before Einstein, that space-time geometry must be dynamical. The Greeks didn't say it. Ancient sages of India didn't say it. Nobody said it. So in 1915, when this word was first spoken, Many philosophers decided that ah, this is crap, it can't happen. How can geometry change? Indeed, you might sitting, sitting in this room, you might think that geometry can't change. Come on, we're all sitting still, but you know you're not, right? You know you're not sitting still. You're moving at tremendous velocities towards the center of the galaxy. And, uh, but that's not the point. The point is that the geometry is indeed changing in this very room now, but changing by a very, very tiny, imperceptible amount. So that's the point here. This is, this is all the greatness. Matter tells space-time how to curve, space-time tells matter how to move. 
Evidence of dynamical space time, yes, indeed, gravitational waves about which you've heard. Direct detection happened very uh, recently, but before that we knew they must be there because in the 90s there was some fantastic discovery of pulsar timing arrays, pulsar timing delays, and, and that proved that gravitational waves have to exist. We were just waiting for technology to catch up for direct detection, and it finally has. Then, of course, you have the well, here it is the expanding universe, and what is hidden, as you would expect, is black holes. So, all these are examples of dynamical space time. So, this is all, all the everything is known here. Shomodip must be teaching GR now in your courses, so you all know from his courses, right? Am I right, Shomodip? You teach GR, right? So, this is a perihelion precession of planets. Even the Earth undergoes this, but smaller than Mercury because it's closest to the sun. This is the light bending. This is the sun and this is the star. This is the star far away and light you can see is, is bending. This is what is called Shapiro timing delay. And this is the red shift that I was talking about. So all these are called the classical tests of gravity. But more than that, nowadays we have better evidence of GR, namely gravitational waves. This is a famous LIGO uh, signal from the two LIGO observatories, and they match perfectly here. We have CMB, Madame Shuchatona is the expert on that, sitting right here, and this CMB spectrum follows the predictions of GR, and more very recently, I think this was two, three years ago, three years ago, 18, 18, 18 or 19, whatever, uh, it's, it's uh, the, and, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope gave out this picture. And newspapers were very eloquent about this picture, saying that, ah, look at the orange glow. This is false color, my God. There's no orange glow. <laughs> this is a microwave. So please discard newspaper pundits who talk about orange glow, okay? But is there a problem? All this is all very good. Is there a problem? Again, the question is the Einstein equation. So if I go back to the Einstein equation, <laughs> Yeah, there. This I said is the curvature, it's some combination of curvatures, and this is energy momentum, right? Now, this curvature is, of course, a smooth geometry. It's smooth because space time is supposed to be smooth. That's one of the great assumptions of Albert Einstein. What about the energy momentum tensor here? Well, let's see. We know that energy is quantized from quantum mechanics, and therefore, momentum also has to be quantized. There may be special cases, but in general, this quantization is real. And in fact, I've written down the classical energy momentum tensor for a bunch of particles, just like I wrote down the classical current into a bunch of particles. Here it is. So if you have only particles, which is what we do, in nature, matter consists only of particles. So the energy momentum tensor must have some structure like this. There could be special cases where you, you know, massage this into some nice looking thing. But so are we back to the point of the left-hand side being something nice, smooth, continuous, and the right-hand side having these horrible delta functions? I think the answer is yes. So the problem is not that we have observations, unlike the black body radiation. Oh, so I should tell you now a little bit why I wrote the term Bose in that earlier slide. That was just to say that even with his light quantum hypothesis, Einstein was not able to calculate the, the black body distribution. Why? Because he was making a wrong assumption about the statistics of the particles. They had to obey the Bose Einstein statistics. Only then, so why was Einstein so happy? Because Bose solved, it will come. Hi, Baba. <laughs> Ashtra. Where's the key button? Here the button is. How are you? So, so then the question is, what is happening? So I, I quote, I basically quote Einstein's objection to Maxwell just by saying that how can discrete bits of matter and energy and momentum produce a smooth continuous space-time geometry? 
but are there contradictions? Not any observational contradictions. No known observational contradictions to GR with experiment exist till today. So you can ask, why do people do modified gravity? It's more or less the same argument that I'm giving. People do modified gravity, people do quantum gravity, not because they're motivated by experiment. Well, my argument for doing so is that there are contradictions. And these contradictions involve black holes, which I think as, once again, remember, black body radiation involves the, the conversion of matter energy into electromagnetic energy and photoelectric effect involves the other way around, electromagnetic energy to matter. And here I think is a question of geometry. So matter is being totally converted to space-time geometry. That's what happens in a black hole. Black hole has nothing. No matter inside a black hole. That's the theory, that's what the theory says. We don't know because if you enter the black hole once, you can't come out. I know that because I'm already inside a black hole. <laughs> Have you worked in it for such a long time? <laughs> so some people say that your papers, do they mean anything? Do they carry information? That's another story. We won't get into that. So, so there is this thing that there's also this big bang, which we don't understand at all. Big bang is not a theory. It's an ignorance, statement of ignorance. But you can believe that it's sort of a conversion of space-time geometry screwing out matter matter coming out of space-time geometry. Because if you ask, was there matter before the Big Bang? No answer. Was there space-time geometry before the Big Bang? But let's look at it, maybe. So there's a little window of opportunity there which you could use and say, well, okay, fine. Then it must, matter must be a byproduct of some peculiar thing about space-time geometry. But the funny thing is, you see both of these situations, black holes and Big Bang, especially the early universe and Big Bang, they have something called space-time singularities. And one of the th great thinkers about space-time singularity was the great professor AKR. Oops. Okay, here we are. I have the next picture. So this is an example of space-time singularities. Here is a star. Time going up vertically, the star is collapsing basically due to its own curvature. And here you see is a formation of these horizons, which mean that light can never get out of the horizon. So light comes in. And after a while, the star collapses to, in this diagram, a point. It's actually a region, but this is a point. So this wavy line means that you've lost the star. The star is gone. The entire matter in the star has now collapsed due to gravity. So here we have a situation of conversion of matter to gravity. This is, of course, in Shomodip's course, it must be there. It's called the classical diagram, it's not true geometry. So here, well, I won't explain this because this requires a course, but this is the opposite story of the Big Bang. Here is the Big Bang, and it's a story that all of you probably have seen many times the birth of the universe, the Big Bang. Let me not even try to get into that. But what I would like to, hi Baba. Ah, there is a man. He was one of the earliest thinkers because before him, people felt that it was some property of the models which produced the singularity. And he was the man who said, no, 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 model for the law. You can write down an equation which will tell you if you're going to have a singularity or not. And to his own great dismay, he found that singularities are generic in generativity, okay? So what happens is like this. So suppose you have three particles, maybe three of us, maybe three presidency college building, presidency university buildings, whatever. They are, because gravity is attractive, let us say they're sort of coming together. Now each one by itself has its own world line in curved space time. And what I've drawn is the local light cone, which tells you the local time. So you know that time is relative. Here you have this time, here you have that time, given by you know, this vertical upward here, and similarly here. And as the three come together and merge, then you have a problem, because what happens afterwards? Whose time do you take? You had three times, 
there's an ambiguity in the definition of time. And not only that, it's also space beyond the merger point. The merger point is called a caustic formation. As is known in optics, you have caustic formation, but that is a caustic in space. If you have a caustic tomorrow, then we cannot avoid it. A caustic in space can be easily avoided. You can go around it, but a caustic in time cannot be avoided because it's tomorrow and it's everybody's tomorrow, right? How do you avoid tomorrow? So you see, caustics in time become horrendous. And that is what Rajoudhuri talked about as a singularity without paying any attention to the symmetries of the space time. So this was, this was gigantic because nobody else before him had even thought of looking at it like this. So AKR, whose anniversary, whose uh, talk, oh, yeah. anniversary, memorial lecture is coming up. I trust that all of you will be there to, to listen to this. But there's another problem. And this problem is something that I have thought about and worked on a bit. So it's called, well, it's, I, 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 I think I, I said further conundrum. This is again the collapse problem of a black hole, right? Yes. No. I don't understand. Yeah, so there goes that. Right. Yeah. So I was going to say that this is the picture. Well, uh, okay, but how am I doing with regard to timing? I have some 10, 15 minutes? Or? 10 minutes. Uh, 10, 15, minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, very good. So I have this uh, picture of a black hole. This is a star collapsing, and you can see that the light cones are tilting, and the light cones are trapped. So if you shine a torch from here, it will stay inside this dotted line called the horizon. And then, of course, the star continues to shrink and becomes a singularity. So this is the same picture which I showed earlier. That's a black hole. But I wanted to tell you that based on the Einstein equation, three very well-known relativists, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking in the 70s proved these theorems. They're called laws of black hole mechanics. They follow directly from Einstein's equation. What do they say? Well, the first thing say is, this is what I call Hawking's area theorem. It's uh, maybe has the same name right now, but some people call it the second law of black hole mechanics. I call it the, the earliest law of black hole mechanics. Basically what it's telling you that is that the area of a black hole cannot decrease in any process. Now, if you make that statement, you immediately realize then two black holes can merge into one, but a black hole cannot split up into two. So whole slew of physical processes as to physically, as to physical processes, which people didn't worry about, now can be ruled out completely. You don't have to worry about it. So this is possible, this is not. And there's also a zeroth law which says that if you have a black hole, you have a horizon, then something like acceleration due to gravity close to the horizon in general should have been a non-constant, should have been a function of where you are. Everything in gravity is a function of where you are. But it turns out that acceleration due to gravity is a constant on the horizon. So that's one of the, the other surprises. And then you have something that looks like a, the first law of thermodynamics. Point is that these all look very close to the laws of thermodynamics. This looks like the law of entropy increase. This looks like the idea of a temperature. And this is of course the first law. But the question of thermodynamics doesn't arise because thermodynamics is a statistical law. It has to do with many, 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 many particles. Too many to track their individual motions, right? And therefore, that's a very different situation. Here, you only have a black hole, which is an exact solution of Einstein's equation. Where are the many, 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 many particles? So what do you mean by any relation to thermodynamics? It's actually not there. So these people were very careful. They said, these are suggestive of the laws of thermodynamics, but at this point, we're not sure. But there was this guy called Beckenstein. Ah, my favorite chap. He was a student at Princeton. He was slightly older than you, he was a PhD student. 
or we don't like the PhD students. So we have examples like, or we don't know, you're not angry, right? Well, comparison to Beckenstein shouldn't make you angry. So anyway, so Beckenstein, uh, Beckenstein felt that, huh? So anyway, Beckenstein felt that these laws were very close to the laws of, too close to the laws of, electro, of, of thermodynamics, and therefore there must be a way to bring in thermodynamics. And his argument was very physical. He said, look, if you have this object, and here is our champion of accretion sitting there, Professor Ritoban Chatterjee. This is, this is an accreting black hole. So the black hole is somewhere here, and this is the accretion disk, and there's some blue giant sitting there from which stuff is falling into the black hole. And this is, I know Ritoban's favorite. He works on jets. And in learning Chatterjee, of course, I forgot. Sorry, part, part, two experts on accretion. Yeah, my God. Indonil, I should have spoken about first because he, he became an accretion specialist many years ago, right? <laughs> so Indonil is, is, is uh, I think as a PhD student, you started working on accretion. So it's a very, it's quite a bit ago, not as ago as, as long ago as my PhD, but still quite a bit ago. Sorry, Indonil, I, I should have remembered that. <laughs> no, 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 this, this is true. I mean, uh, so accretion is uh, very important. And if you have accretion, then the, the entropy of the stuff is decreasing, right? So the stuff is going into the black hole. Now everything is going into the black hole. It's come back. Okay. So the point is that this will uh, be a problem. And uh, so he says that there, there must be a way of adding on the entropy of the external universe to the entropy of a black hole. And the black hole entropy must be proportional to the area. Now, this is called the generalized second law, which I've put here. In a universe with black holes, this law must be right, okay? We don't have a proof of this yet from GR. I don't think you can prove it from GR, but perhaps from quantum gravity. But the question that people ask is, what about the, the origin of this entropy of a black hole? And Beckenstein was, of course, he was hiding himself because if it was GR, he would have to say it comes from GR, but it doesn't come from GR. So he says must be quantum gravity. So what is quantum gravity? Well, I don't have too much time. So I shall talk about proposals simply because there is no complete theory of quantum gravity yet, unlike quantum electrodynamics. What are the categories of proposals? Well, there is a background dependent proposal where all you do is talk about weak perturbations around some classical solution of Einstein's equation. And then there are background independent non-perturbative, non-dynamical uh, approach, not non-perturbative. So there's no non-dynamical degree of freedom in the non-perturbative approach, the background independent approach. So there we are. In the background independent independent approach, you have loop quantum gravity, causal dy dynamical triangulation, spin forms, causal set, those of which describe quantum space-time geometry. What do I mean by quantum space-time geometry? <coughs> background dependent are these Euclidean quantum gravity, string theory, and all these, which describe quantum gravitational fields. We have a problem because most time, most of the standard theories, we assume a flat background and when we quantize it, we don't care about the background at all. But if you do care about the background because background cannot be assumed because it, it has to have an origin in the theory itself. And then there is no observational hint from nature. So what I shall do, again, I don't have time. So how much time do I have now? 10, five, give me 10. Unless he comes. Okay, so I have to give her. Shukumar, I have to give her. Okay, so you have a gauge invariance associated with gravity. This gauge invariance is, of course, the general coordinate invariance, which I already mentioned. But together with that, we have local Lorentz invariance because we can draw at every point a local light cone. So there must be local Lorentz invariance, right? But it depends on where you are. That is why it's local. Now, if it is a local Lorentz invariance, you know that local Lorentz invariance has both Lorentz boosts 
which is what you call Lorentz transformations in the undergraduate classes. And you also have spatial rotations, local rotations. So the angular theta of the rotation depends on where you are. You can choose a gauge called the time gauge in which you freeze the local boosts and you're left with just the rotation, which is called the group SU2, okay? That you know from quantum mechanics is the group of rotations. And there are these spins which characterize the quantum numbers there. So without going into all this, I'll just say that we have a picture of quantum space, which I have color coded here with these links, with these lines. So it's a network, a network whose lines carry that spin, half, one, whatever, okay? Three half, and whose indices are very standard indices. Ronica delta and the Levi Civita epsilon ij group, okay? That's all. So at these vertices, that's where, where the, the invariant tensors occur. And you have these guys here. And you have a close oriented network. If, if you strain your eyes, you can see little arrows here. So it's an oriented network. Each of these edges have an orientation. The great thing about this kind of a picture is that in this picture, what you can show is that the area of any object, okay, especially the the event horizon of a black hole is quantized. It's discrete. So this is the area operator. You calculate the area operator, take this action of this area operator on the states which are described by this. And then you can show that the eigenvalues are discrete. That's obvious from here. For the black hole, especially it is possible to prove that the eigenvalues must be bounded from above. So K, is something that occurs when you describe the black hole in the quantum geometry way. It's an integer, maybe a very large integer. So these are bounded from above, but there's also an area gap, much like the ground state energy. So the difference, the ground state, there's a zero point energy for the harmonic oscillator. Similarly, you have a zero point area in this loop quantum gravity, okay? There's a zero point area, which means that you cannot have zero area in loop quantum gravity. So when you talk of collapse of a black hole or collapse of the or, or beginning of the universe from zero area, that's not possible in this theory, okay? There must be a minimum area from which it begins. So there, there the question of singularity has become very weird because singularity we imagine as when something collapses to a point, but if there's a minimum area, this is not going to let you collapse to that point. Okay, now, uh, about horizon dynamics, all I can, I, I will have to skip all these details, but I'll just go to this thing and say that a horizon you see is a light-like surface. Now, if you have a light-like surface, then you know that it has a very special property. It cannot be a surface like this surface here or any of this surface, which means that the length is described by something called a metric and the metric is a matrix which you cannot invert if you are on the light-like surface. Now, if you cannot invert a matrix, then you have a problem because most of the theories we write down anywhere in any surface, we involve these invertible matrices. So if the metric is degenerate, the induced metric is degenerate, which means that it has zero eigenvalue, even one zero eigenvalue, actually it has two in four dimensions, then you find that your horizon dynamics must be described by something called a topological field theory. And the topological field theory is one which does not have an equation of motion. It only has an equation of constraint. An example is this Jan Simons theory. So this is the topological field theory. So here, this is the topological FAB. FAB is nothing but the electric and magnetic fields, but not of Maxwell, of Jan Simons. And this is the effect of the bulk on the horizon. So sigma i a b is the effect of the bulk on the horizon. So this equation is like saying you have an electric field equal to the current. So this is like the current. It's not that you have a divergence of the electric field or some operator acting on the electric field equal to a current or curl of b is equal to the current. It's a b which is equal to the current. So this is certainly cannot be thought of as an equation of motion. It's an equation of constraint but that is what you get in the topological field theory. That leads to this picture, quantum black hole picture. Aha, I think, is that Shubhumar now? Oh, it's not. So I have a few more minutes. 
So this is what it looks like. So what we have here, these are the edges of, you know, the, the network, spin network, which is describing the bulk. And on this surface, this is the model of the surface that impinge and making make little punctures where they deposit their spins. So we have a whole sphere with punctures on it, right? And if you are able to take account of these punctures, now you have a situation which is no longer one solution of Einstein's equation. You have many, 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 many punctures on your horizon. And if you have many, 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 many punctures, you can turn on the machinery of statistical mechanics to calculate the entropy. And indeed, what we get as the entropy is a little bit better than what Bekenstein thought. So you can write the entropy in terms of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. I should tell you, I don't have time to get into Hawking radiation today. Hawking's work was also fantastic, unless uh, Madam gives me a little time. I can say a little bit about Hawking radiation, but uh, I can't really, I don't want to stretch your uh, concentration or patience. So here you have the Bekenstein Hawking. So Hawking's contribution. So I already mentioned that Bekenstein had this proportionality with area, and he also had this LP squared, which is a Planck length squared. Planck length is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That is a scale which is supposed, no proof, but supposed to trigger the onset of quantum gravity. So it's a very, very, very tiny scale as opposed to scale, say the Compton wavelength of an electron, which is what 10 to the minus, um, I don't know, 15 centimeters or something. Yeah, yeah. And Angstrom for instance, say 10 to the minus eight. So, so you have these other length scales, but this is very, 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 very tiny. So Meckenstein already figured that, you know, in units of Boltzmann constant, Entropy is a dimensionless quantity, but this four was what, well, you can see. So all Hawking has done is to contribute the four. No, I'll, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll skip this and uh, yeah, so I, I probably should stop now, right? I mean, I, I what is, well, I can continue, is it? Okay, great. Um, so maybe a little bit about Hawking radiation. Madam here, Ratna, Professor Ratna Kole, teaches this in some of your classes, right? If, if you are going to learn field theory, then Rathna would have taught you this. So you know about quantum field theory. I already mentioned harmonic oscillators and so on. And uh, there is a unique vacuum, but when you have curved fields, the curved space time, one of fields in curved space time, then there is no unique. So vacuum here means the collective ground state of all those harmonic oscillators. So imagine that you have all these uncoupled harmonic oscillators, but they have a common ground state, okay? Now, in flat space time, the ground state is uniquely specified because it must satisfy certain symmetry requirements. It must be symmetrical under Lorentz transformations, and it must also be symmetrical under space time translations. However, if you have curved space time, this is not true. There's a problem of vacuum. And because of this, again, to cut a long story short, you can think of two kinds of vacua, one at very much in the past and the other at very much in the future. So you define the vacuum in the past as one which is standard vacuum, no particles. But then you find that the machinery of the theory will force you okay, to describe the vacuum in the future as, consists, as having particles, and this amplitude is given by this Bogolyubov coefficient beta ij squared. So this is the famous particle creation by black holes, which is the essence of Hawking radiation. Now what? Ah. However, this is where I'd like to differ. So Hawking felt that, okay, so there was one slide, I thought there was a slide. Oh, come on. Yeah, Matt doesn't like you. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I, was, uh, what I was going to tell you is that you see that Hawking predicted that there will be a thermal Planckian distribution of particles right here, very, very far away from the black hole horizon, okay? 
Of course, you can't see this Hawking radiation. So, so far, we do not know if Hawking is right. His calculation seems perfect, but is he right? I have not seen black hole radiation, but there's a reason why you won't be able to see black hole radiation, perhaps. And that's because of CMB. CMB is three degrees Kelvin, but if you take Hawking's calculation of the Hawking temperature, then you find that most black holes will have sub millimeter, uh, sub, sub Kelvin, um, milli Kelvin, so less than 10 to the minus three Kelvins temperature. Now, if you have a signal which is already like this light, so if you have a very, very dim light, you're not going to be able to detect it, right? It's obvious, the background swamps it. So why does it didn't Stephen believe and why did AKR not, not believe? Why did he scoff at it? I mean, he's right. Injoni is absolutely right. You couldn't believe it. Because you find that if you have a black hole which is radiating, as it radiates, it will, of course, lose its energy. And therefore, its horizon will now shrink. Previously, you had a star which was shrinking, but now it's a horizon which is shrinking. And shrinking, and shrinking, and shrinking. And then Hawking says it will just disappear, leaving some heat. But hey, the star was formed, you know, from the astrophysics of star formation from pure states. And we heard from you last time about how stars form. So stars are formed out of pure states. But then if you have heat, you cannot describe heat by a pure state, pure quantum state like psi, which you do in quantum mechanics. You have to use something called a density matrix. Some of you may have studied density matrices. However, quantum mechanics forbids this transformation, this transition from something describing a pure state evolving to something that can only be described by a density matrix. So this is called the information loss paradox. But, and this is going to be my last slide, uh, and then I'll jump to the outlook. I would like to say the following. What Stephen Hawking, ah, Shukumar Da. So Shukumar Da, our actor slide. Huh? <laughs> So you see, we have a description of the horizon which Stephen Hawking did not have. Now you might say, Stephen Hawking did not have this and he has it. No, not me. It's not me. I did not discover it, but some people did. I can only give a good argument as to why this Jan Simon's description is good. But now that you know that a horizon is Chern Simon states, you could actually do a quantum field theory calculation. It's difficult, but you can do it involving pure states. Will you get a thermal radiation? No, you will not. You will probably get a radiation like from an atom. Now you can get thermal radiation out of an atom if you wait long enough, but you can also get coherent radiation. There is Shobhan expert on coherent radiation. So it is possible that a black hole will have a radiation. Of course, it will radiate. Radiation is quantum mechanical. It has to radiate. But because of our understanding of quantum gravity, there will be a quantum part which is coherent. And if this is true, then there is no question of going down to a situation where there's only heat left, OK? Now, what you have to show then is to do the full quantum calculation and do a coarse graining average over the horizon states. Then you get to where Stephen Hawking was in his calculation. If you are able to recover his thermal distribution, his Planckian distribution, then you have shown that it is possible to have only coherent, to have, to have not only thermal radiation. And then the information loss paradox is found. Okay. So this is a hope. This is not a solution. So let me just, uh, I wanted to show you something related to experiment after all this is an astro colloquium, but maybe some other time. 
look, I have graphs. These are graphs related to data. So this is proof that you know I'm not lying. Okay. I couldn't draw these graphs. My collaborator on our job, who was a student here, student of our teachers here, he do it. Okay, so this is my last slide, and very nice. You have Shukumarda here. Shukumarda, hello, Chanto. Okay, so what I should say is that what we did, let me just give you a review of what we did. What we did was use this generalized second law and another law which Bekenstein proposed for which I also had some theoretical justification and that's called the Bekenstein bound. Let me show that one, just one second about the Bekenstein bound because that's a very powerful statement. About you. Jana. Oof, hey, I must bring my own laptop next time. Ah, yeah, just the statement in red of all compact astrophysical objects of a given cross sectional area, a black hole whose horizon area equals that cross sectional area carries the largest entropy. In other words, every star you can think of has its entropy bounded from above by the entropy of a black hole whose horizon area is the same as the actual cross-sectional area of the star. So this was again a, a hypothesis of Bekenstein, but I, I have some theoretical understanding of this, which I can share with you later on. Now, given these two, we were able to find out a lower bound on the area of any compact object in binary compact coalescence. Okay, when two binary objects, be they black holes, be they neutron stars, be they some other exotic objects like grava stars or boson stars, if they coalesce together, then the area of the remnant is bounded from below by this inequality, which can be expressed in terms of the aerial radii as this inequality. And as it is the result of this inequality, which is shown here, and my friend, collaborator, former student, Onarjo, was very sharp. He said, well, we can turn this into a prediction of the, into, into a constraint on the equation of states, okay? So this bound is a separate piece of information. If you accept the bound, then you don't need a piece of data called the data on tidal deformabilities of neutron stars. So if you look at binary neutron star collapse, which we have actually observed, then this bound will tell you how good your equation of state is. So you have to then start with an equation of state, okay? Any fiducial equation of state, calculate these masses and from them the areas, okay? Now, if you find that the measured remnant area is less than our prediction, then you believing our prediction, you say this equation of state is hopeless. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. So again, this is a proof of principle, not exhaustive. We are working on this. So hopefully someday I'll be able to say this. So this is the final, definitely the final transparency. We are being trying to form up the neutron star equation of state constraint, but you see the point about my, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it is possible to link something you derive from quantum gravity to something in binary compact coalescence, something which is very much used by LIGO, Virgo, Kagra, everything. Okay, and maybe LIGO India, if it gets off the ground. So this is something which, which uh, we are very excited about. It's, really, it's not completely independent of data. We're, okay, you might say that, oh, that, that's, that's such a small effect. You can't detect it now. But once again, our friends, astrophysicists friends here have taught me that accuracy in astrophysics is an ever increasing property. So maybe someday, maybe someday you'll get to the accuracy where you can actually say, that this quantum gravity effect is there or not. And that's it. That will be the link with experiment, right? So area gap, you know, is, is a very important thing in loop quantum gravity because it says that ever, evaporation must stop. There's a minimum area beyond which you can't go, okay? 
So then you can use that to talk about dark matter. Again, there are ideas which I can discuss maybe separately. The information loss puzzle then turns out to be a semi-classical artifact. It is possible for a full quantum theory of gravity not to have this puzzle at all. So again, this is a hope. You know that in particle physics, there is this humongous problem known as the quark lepton masses. You have something like the neutrino, whose mass is probably what, milli electron volt, or I don't know, maybe less. And then you have the top quark, whose mass is a humongous 150 GeV. Hmm? Yeah, some 176, it's, it's, it's huge. Why top quark? And they, they somehow they're called families also. But can you imagine a family where the elder brother is like 2000 times more massive than the younger sister? Or 2000, no, two into 10 to the something, 15 or something. Now it's ridiculous, right? It's completely ridiculous. So they're not in one family. So if they're in a family, it's because we characterize them badly. So where do these masses come from? It's a puzzle. And my feeling is that quantum geometry is one thing which you have not taken into account when you spoke, spoke, speak about these masses. These masses are spoken about always in flat space time. I can't believe that gravity cannot have a role to play because in the very early universe, that is where you would have created a top quark. You would have created a top quark before it decayed into the lighter quarks, right? And therefore, there's a good reason to believe that maybe you should, you should go back to that time and their gravity in the early universe is going to play a major role. All these are hopes. But the bottom line I want to say is that GR, what you learn, what we teach, the space-time continuum cannot be fundamental. There must be an underlying structure. Okay, thanks very much for your patience. Questions, so of questions. course. Yeah, absolutely. Or questions from the audience? Hello. Yes. So, Julie. Yes. First of all, sir, that was really fantastic. Thank you. Now, my question is a kind of a very basic one. That like, uh, you said that photons uh, follow the on the like the uh, margin of the light pools. So, uh, what path will be followed by the gravitons or the neutrinos? Which yeah. See, I did not mention gravitons uh, because gravitons have a seat. Gravitons, unlike photons, have not been observed simply because we are not smart enough to build a gravito multiplier. You know, photons are observed. To observe photons, you need photomultiplier tubes. But what for gravity? So we have no idea that gravitons exist in nature. Okay. Now, according to the theory, we have seen gravitational waves. If gravitational waves can be quantized like yeah, electromagnetic waves, yeah. So if gravitational waves can be quantized like electromagnetic waves, in fact, the theory of gravitational waves with some gauge fixing, etc., looks very much like the theory of electromagnetic waves. Okay. The only difference is that which you may know is that for electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation is produced by a dipole, an oscillating dipole. Quadrupole. There you need a quadrupole because of an extra index in the polarization tensor. That's all. And therefore, they must travel at the velocity of light, the same as the velocity of light. But again, Honor Joe, my collaborator, is working on a project for his PhD called the speed of gravity. So this is subjudice. It's, it's under research. They want to see what experimentally what information you have about the speed of gravity. If it is different from the speed of light, we have issues, right? We have one thing to do. Gravity, it could be anything, part. right? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, Indonesia has a question, I'm sure. <laughs> Very basic. So don't apologize. It's all basic, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, what we understand about space time is <laughs> from Einstein, of course, is that if you, uh, if you, I mean, it's basically uh, internal mobility in right? Well, uh, yeah, that's called a space.
it's time interval. So it's no any. I mean, for example, time is something is an interval of two events at the same point in space. Yeah, sure. So this yeah. Is like, yeah. Again, very basic. Now, my question is, if, if space and time, which is an interval between two events, does it make any sense calling it to be quantized? I mean, of course, I understand you, your argument. I mean, this I argument I have before as well. And uh, all, all see that in the right side of it, um, on one side, you have a smooth uh, geometry kind of stuff, and the other side, you have a mask, and it is dirty and can be quantized and whatever. So, well, if it is quantized, why not this part? So, I understand. My question is like, I mean, if it is just to interval, does it make any sense? To talk yeah, about okay. So, the good question, of course. First of all, I cannot say that there is any idea in loop quantum gravity about the quantization of time. Because it's a Hamiltonian approach. In a Hamiltonian approach, you always look at a spatial slice at a fixed time, and then look at how things, you define things on that, and then go to another spatial slice. And this evolution, time evolution, discreteness is not guaranteed. So we don't talk about discreteness in time. Now, discreteness in space. You see, not all classical variables become important in quantum mechanics. We know that from ordinary quantum mechanics, right? For instance, we know that even for a, for a particle, talking about localization is a problem. You have to talk about a wave packet, right? So therefore, here also, you don't talk about the interval, a spatial interval, but you can talk about area. In fact, you can talk about length as well, and the length is also quantized. The length operator, is a Hermitian self-adjoint operator, which has discrete eigenvalues in exactly like the way I showed for the area. So there are geometrical variables, which now have very different properties than the classical. Now in the classical theory of area, for instance, yeah, right here, you cannot expect that the area of any surface has both a lower bound and an upper bound. So this is the difference. Let's take the area of a horizon. Now, classically, that's some, some sphere, four pi r squared is the area, right? And when it shrinks, according to Hawking, it shrinks to nothing, zero. So you go from zero to some four pi r squared, whatever r is. Here, on the other hand, it can't be that. It has certain distinct values. It can never shrink to zero. And it can never exceed some large integer. I mean, characterization by some large integer. Okay, of course, there are dimensionless numbers like the Planck radius, Planck area, uh, Planck area, but there is this K which restricts how big it can be. So these are the new things that loop quantum gravity is predicting. Okay, of course, this is all going, only going to happen in the quantum domain. So 10 to the minus 33. So if you ask about the area of my nose, will you see this property on my nose? Yes. If you can come to the 10 to the minus 33 centimeters close to my nose, then it is predicted that you will see this property. Given the quantum domain, yeah. isotropic of space and homogeneity of space is constant. Ah, good point. Good point. Very good point. Uh, one week from tomorrow, Shubhi Sharkar will be in town. He will tell you that even in the large case, Isotropy and homogeneity of space is actually compromised. But anyway, to answer your question, in fact, this is not clear yet. I would believe you that isotropy and homogeneity are actually gone in the quantum fluctuations of space-time at Planck scale. But people, you know, make all sorts of assumptions. So there's a whole slew of activity called loop quantum cosmology, where they assume space to be homogeneous and isotropic. And then they assume space to be homogeneous and isotropic, and then do cosmology. Because without, yeah, so they believe that the cosmological principle is accurate down to 10 to the minus 30, 33 centimeters, yes. Which to me, so I, I have a problem with that. But, so I'll agree with you, but on the other hand, I can cite works, maybe 500 by now, which, yeah. which is, yeah. I I've been hearing you for the last 20 years. 
Oh my God. And you've heard me enough, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> so my question is, how far you because you know spring theory in spite of it no 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 i'm not going to no, no. Again, if, if, if you take a side what i'm asking is the other side of quantum gravity so i that is why i briefly went over the two categories the perturbative approach to quantum gravity which string theory pursues that has problems, that has issues, and I'm not going to hold any brief for string theory. For that, you'll have to wait till Ashok Sen comes here. You can pester him with many questions you can, you want. Now, for the non-perturbative approaches, loop quantum gravity, for instance, I would say that it is not static at all. I mean, it depends on where you start, okay? See, if you take this entire literature of loop quantum gravity, People are considering many things, but it's it's very hard. Yeah. It's I mean I find it very hard. Now there must, must be people smarter than me who do a better job. But I just went to a conference abroad, and there too I find that it's not easy at all. Okay, they also have difficulties. So the Europeans and Americans are also having difficulties. So this is a tough subject. So the progress is slow. I think one has to remember Feynman's dictum that you know you need clues from nature. And my attempt, which I could not describe today for lack of time, is such an attempt because if I'm right, then we have some constraints on neutron stars, equations of state, starting with the formulation of quantum gravity. So there is a link at least that is being established. So there will be works like this all over the place. There are lots of work. Uh, I missed some talks in Canada where I didn't, couldn't go where also people are saying that LIGO must have something to do with quantum gravity. Oh. It's a waveform and, and how that could be a little different from ordinary classical GR. So you have to look for very, very tiny effects in classical GR and gravitational waves would be certainly the place to look for, but not in LIGO or even LIGO India, but perhaps LISA, LISA might, might throw up something. Yeah, again, it's, it's some work we did here, uh, you know, some time back with Ratna was involved about angular momentum of gravitational waves and so on. That has nothing to do with uh, quantum gravity per se, but if there is quantization, you will see structure there as well. So when all our young students here, they grow up to be my age, they certainly could be answer, able to answer your question much better. I'm sure of that. <laughs> So, any other questions? No, 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 very Any other questions? Yes, Ritubha? So, I have several small uh, things. One is, uh, so, the bound that you that you gave you an honor to, so, that area is uh, larger than uh, the area that you directly get from the Wittgenstein area. No, so, it's the same. So the point is that if you have, let's say, a neutron star, as such, calculating its entropy is very difficult. But the Bekenstein statement is that its entropy is exact, is bounded from above. By how much is the difference? I don't know. But it is bounded from above. It can never exceed the entropy of a black hole whose horizon area is exactly the cross-sectional area. So. Uh, Again, because I did not get time to get into this, the idea basically is accretion, is that if you have adiabatic accretion, which is not changing the area of a compact object very much, then you can imagine that if, if this accretion goes on and on and on, at some point, the energy would lead to the collapse of the black hole with the same area as a horizon. So the black hole just, form, the matter goes inside, collapses on itself, and produces a black hole with the same area, provided the area does not change too much. Okay. So this is Bekenstein's idea, basically. So you, so then, uh, so you can say that you are doing a. Uh, in, in case of Bekenstein, it was that some manifestation of uh, quantum states you are seeing in this thermodynamic behavior. So now you are extending it to something like a neutron star to see what 
Yes. So I'm using two limiting areas. One, two limiting theorems of Bekenstein theorems or hypothesis. One is that because the area can't decrease, you can write down an inequality saying that if this was the initial entropy of some kind of accretion process, then the initial entropy must be less than the final entropy because the final entropy is supposed to be larger. So there's a lower bound on that initial entropy. And the other one is for each of the constituents, there is an upper bound on the entropy. So use these two, play around with the inequalities, and then you find that the area must be bounded from above. The remnant area, that was the most important thing. No matter what the astrophysical nature of the colliding of the merging objects are, or what is left out, left over, the remnant. So no matter what their astrophysical nature is, because you already know that if they're black holes, then the area has to increase. That's not a mystery. But will it also happen for neutron stars? If neutron stars merge and become either a neutron star or a black hole, can you say something about the area? Yes, it's, you can at least say there is a bound on that area. That is, that is interesting. Okay. Yeah, so I just had a comment that just after the first BW detection happened, or right. maybe the first neutral star inclusion was over. So uh, I think David Spargel and some other people wrote a paper saying that it was something I, I don't exactly remember, but it was related to the fact that if, if there is a uh, multiple dimension mm. and gravity as sometimes proposed is more into the other dimension, then you should expect something else from gravitational wave propagation, but you are not seeing it. So that is like ah, a thing. Like for there. this, you have to talk to my colleague Shomitro. Because he's working precisely on that. So his idea, see, he works on higher dimensions. And the point is that gravity may be there in higher dimensions or may not be. If it is, if it is not there in higher dimensions, then you should, should see some effects. He's actually produced a paper, one or two papers on that. So we have to ask him to come and give us a seminar on exactly the issue that Yutoban is talking about. But this is being, being researched. I, I've heard about Spurgus paper, but uh, I I have not. Yeah, yeah Shomitra, Shomitra always wants to remove such arguments, you know, because it's his bread and butter to work in higher dimensions. So he will argue that no, 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 Spargel is wrong because dot dot dot, which you have to hear from him. <laughs> and TP TP Singh at TIFR has been claiming for the last two years that he has written a quantum theory of gravity, um, but no one believes. No, I mean. I would like to uh, hear yeah, from you somebody. In the colloquium yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you should call TP, but then I will not be in the audience for sure. What <laughs> about Hey, what about you? Don't worry. About it. Just answer. Yeah, you talk about different light, light, two different light curves which uh, corresponds to different geometries. So my question is like, uh, so from our existing knowledge, do we, uh, do, do we have any, can you, uh, can you comment on uh, which of ob objects or what condition leads, leads to different, these two different geometries? You're talking about light cones? Yeah. Like yeah. The tilting of the light oh, cones. you're talking about the tilting yeah. of the light cones. Yes. Okay, so like I said, you know, in GR, there are two kinds of curvature. So the Einstein equation simply gives you the Ricci curvature. The G is, you know that it's a Ricci curve. I have taught you this course, right? Maybe you've forgotten it because I taught you. <laughs> but anyway, so there is a Ricci curvature. Uh, Riemann can be split up into the Ricci and the Weil. So the Ricci curvature is what comes in the Einstein equation. The Weil is a little dif different. Because I told you the weil is something like, you know, correcting astigmatism. It's like an aberration. So you need cylindrical lenses. So it produces distortion. So the kind of distortions you see, some of them become broader, some of them become thinner. That is produced by the weil. For instance, typically, you have this very funny situation that if you take a simplest black hole, the Schwarzschild black hole, the weil is non-zero for the entire solution, both outside and inside the horizon. The while is non-zero, but you know that the Ricci is zero because that's what you solve to get the Schwarzschild solution. On the other hand, if you look at Big Bang or, or the, the evolution of space-time leading to the Big Bang, then there the while is zero because of space-time homogeneity and isotropy. 
So there is this idea that if you have a scale invariant space time, it will have y zero. But there is the Ricci, which derives from the, the space time fluid, which is taken to be a perfect fluid, which leads to that evolution. Okay. So you have these two types of behavior in two different situations. And these two behaviors lead to different kind of either tilting or this distortion of the light. Okay. Question very relevant. Yeah, Suppose yeah. I'm looking at binary barriers. I can look at the tilting of light cone in the space time. Right, absolutely. That's very weak gravity. Yeah, but let's, but let's in, it doesn't matter. Oh, any binary system, in yeah. fact. So maybe the static Newton star is somewhere in the universe, and then it'll also be light cone bending because, yeah, because of the difference absolutely. in the space time curvature. So in, is there a way that we can? You, you can tell that which one would have Ricci and which yeah, one that has that, 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 the light that, bending that. observation relates to the Ricci. The calculation of the light bending, which was done by Einstein, well, which is, led to the famous experiments at yeah. South Africa and Brazil, they relate to the Ricci. This other thing is harder to see because it's a smaller effect, tinier effect. Okay. I, in fact, if you ask me, I don't know exactly which experiment sees it. So. I will find out and let you know. So that's a very good point. It's a good is point. There any experiment that no, there, there is. is there is, of course, why, experiment. Why? Yeah, there is experiment in which the distortion is seen, but I can't remember the experiment right now. Yeah, right. But it has been seen. So the while is very much a part of reality as well as the which is. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Shavanda. But it's, I would also like some of our younger friends to, well, Maybe there. Spin statistics. Yeah. Oh, look, the way Hawking did the calculation, the answer is very clear. So if you have, so it, it is a property of the vacuum, but the vacuum of which field theory? If, if you're looking at the vacuum state of scalar fields, then you will have the Planckian distribution, which I showed you, which tells you that you have a bunch of bosons which are going to be emitted. Okay. On the other hand, you could have a, you could look at the vacuum of a bunch of fermions, and then you will see a Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay. So it, it is possible to get either of the two, either a Fermi Dirac distribution for fermions and for a, a Planckian distribution for bosons. Both are possible. So the Fermi statistics theorem, I mean, the, the, the spin statistics theorem, the proof of the spin statistics theorem in an arbitrary curved space time is very hard. It hasn't been done, but that is true for most of arbitrarily curved space times. You can't even solve the equations, the Einstein equation for an arbitrarily curved space time. So we impose something called isometry, which is symmetry of the metric. When we do such imposition, then you can answer your question because then you can prove such a theorem. But only in that case. In the most general case, no proof yet. Not that I know of. Okay. Uh, the question is, 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 you are looking at the distribution of particles, the thermal distribution way at infinity. Now, if you assume that space-time is flat at infinity, more or less, it's asymptotically flat, then you have your standard statistics to look at there, right? So there, there is no problem. There's a standard spin. So if you have photons being radiated or gravitons being radiated, they'll all be plunked in this field. On the other hand, if you're radiating neutrinos, then you have Fermi Dirac distribution. This is completely okay. But if you ask what is happening very close to the black hole, do I have a spin statistics theorem there? That answer is not easy. But again, if you assume that the black hole is spherically symmetric or something, if you assume the symmetries of the black hole uh, uh, space time, then you can prove certain theorems. So it depends on what you assume. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? I have 
lots of questions, but I'm just going to make one comment about the last point that you spoke about the mass hierarchy in part of the Oh, no, please. I'm not, that was a stray thought. No, I've no, not no, done no, anything on it. Particle physics, but let me just uh, tell something because since you mentioned that, uh, because you know, all particle physics calculations are flex based, right. all, all are new house. And if you believe that, okay, you know, when you talk about the early universe, you can't really think of in first of all, it's definitely not mean it's certainly not mean Let's right. uh, and even if, if it's, it's global curvature, local curvature, global curvature is flat. Uh, even small iterations or anything. So, so definitely Minkowski is not the correct, we know that the correct description for making this part. So once, for example, we, in our cosmology class, this was in uh, Shomendra Prakishabu's class. So we had a discussion about neutrino decoupling. And you know, when you do the temperature calculations and at what energy scale neutrino decoupling happens, you actually do it all like, in, in, so it, the, the particle physics, the physics is all flat. Yeah, right? yeah. But then there was a question in the class that what would happen to the neutrino decoupling energy scale or time scale? How many seconds after a big bang will it happen if there is a global curvature? Yeah, very, very good question, actually. Okay. So I guess, uh, I don't know, but, but I, we did not do the calculation, but we had like qualitative arguments because it's going to change the scale where the thermal decoupling can happen. So that always makes me feel, make this feeling that uh, when we talk about all these particle physics numbers, uh, can we really take into account, I mean, will it make any difference, curvature? Because yeah. all the experimental tests are collider data. There you have been passed. Yeah. But the only oh, yeah, species in the early universe, uh, I mean, it's sometimes very, Hard to not uh, take gravity into account. Look, uh, you, so you, that you, might... <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, we can't expect to, to have the answer to every question. I do not know the answer to this question, but I totally agree with you that in the early universe, the neutrino decoupling temperature is going to be different from the one calculated. If I, if I assume flat. Yes. Assume yeah, assume the one that you would do in the textbooks is always in flat space time. Right? So there are innumerable such differences to particle physics. Now, of course, my particle physics colleagues, when I mention this to them, they look at me a bit suspiciously because they said, oh my God, do we have to know about special of, of general relativity? Yeah, because you know, no, this is 